Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the channel, my friends. Today we are watching Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode five, The Enemy Within. My friends, I can't wait to watch these. These are absolutely everything I thought they would be, even Charlie X. Um, but with that being said, the last two have been absolute bangers with Where No Man Has Gone Before and The Naked Time. Fantastic stuff. If I've got to get through the Charlie X's to get to those two, so be it. And you know what? I didn't even mind Charlie X that much. So let's keep going in this exploration of the original series. For those of you that are re-watching with me, thank you. For those of you that are joining me for the first time and watching through this series the same way I am, welcome. My friends, if you could do me a favor, hit that like button, smash the subscribe, ring that bell for notifications for any time we go live here on YouTube with any Star Trek or sci-fi related content. And if you'd like a longer form of that Star Trek and sci-fi related content, or you'd like to get it a couple episodes early, my friends, the link to the Patreon is down in the description. We would love to have you. Growing community, growing library, it's open to you all. Please join us. But my friends, that is then. This is now, and right now, we are ready for Star Trek, the original series, season one, episode five, The Enemy Within. Only one thing left to do, my friends. Engage maximum warp reaction, and away we go. <laughs> Love that ship. Early in the morning recording, everybody. Gotta have that coffee. This looks like the uh, planet from the man trap. Sulu! With a, a unipop. Like a unicorn pop. It's starting to drop. Yeah. At night, it gets down to 120 degrees below zero. Wow. Oh, wow. Back to the ship. Report to the sick bay. Yes, sir. So, are, like, the, the blue jumpsuits, like, techs? Like, Geological technicians? Technician. Yeah. Ready to beam up. Geological technician. So this guy, like, pick up something, I wonder? Yep. I wonder if that stuff that he has on him is causing a problem. Some kind of yellow war. Magnetic. Decontaminate that unipod. Yep. That's a problem. And I could like a burnout. What's that mean, Scotty? Like, did it tax the system too much? Blow a fuse? Captain Kirk, ready to beam up. Just one moment, Captain. Yeah, clear that stuff out. Oh, it's getting cold on the planet. Transporters are on the fritz. You better go get a synchronic meter so we can double check. Yes, sir. Right. I'm starting to smell what the Star Trek is cooking. All right, Captain. Locked onto you. Same shit. Now, see, uh, Jim did touch them. The, the uh, Daniels, I think, was the, the tech. Uh-oh. Whoa. Scotty, maybe shut down the transporters. Just don't leave the transporter room unattended, folks. We'll be right back, sir. What the hell? What the hell is this? Okay, it's split, Jim. Okay, so my question is this. I remember in The Next Generation, I've seen probably 50% of The Next Generation, that there was a transporter malfunction involving Riker, where Riker actually had a transporter twin um i remember he wore a tan uniform like he was it happened like earlier in riker's career or something um i wonder is that the same thing is this like a was that a callback to this man the transporter is so effed up i mean there are so many things you could do immortality unknown to any of us during this time a duplicate of me some strange alter ego had been created so it's not a split it's a brand new He doesn't have a Delta. I actually wasn't paying attention. Did every, everybody have a Delta? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's got it. Okay, maybe that's a way to differentiate them. So this is this is like regular Jim, and then the other's the alter ego. Ship's manifests, sir. I think they're in order now. Thank you. I've checked. That's all. 
Well, that's kind of dismissive, Jim. I'd like to know all of the Captain Tchotchkes that he has in his room and if they mean anything, like prior missions or anything. Let me vacuum that up. Hey, Fisher. A little Windex on that. Sorry, I'm Brandy. The hand's much better, sir. All right, come on, Bones. You have to know that there's something wrong with this. Good for you, Jim. I said give me the brandy! Uh, okay, Leonard, let's... I don't like this at all. Come on, Bones. Get a hold of Spock. Oh, does she paint? Is she an artist? Oh, that was a good cut. Good cut. Man. Oh, Bill Shatner. Brick shit house, man. Yes, Mr. Spock. What is it? Is there something I can do for you, Captain? Like what? Good. Good, Bones. Well, our good doctor said that you were acting like a wild man. Demanded brandy. <laughs> our good doctor's been putting you on again. Hmm. Yeah, Spock doesn't buy that. What is it, Scotty? We've got this unicorn pup. Yes, a few seconds. After they sent this one up through the transporter, that duplicate appeared. Except it's not a duplicate. It's an opposite. How do you know that? Some kind of savage, ferocious opposite. Captain. Huh. Don't dare send Mr. Sulu and the landing party up. If this should happen to a man. Well. Oh, no. Uh... Well, they put Grace Lee Whitney in a lot of these situations. Charlie X. I'm assuming. Yeah. He's still there. Oh, Captain. Not in there. Oh, the Delta's back on there now. Did I just miss that before? Can I help you, Captain? I don't like this at all. You're too beautiful to ignore. Oh, I don't like this. We've both been... Pretending too long. Oh, I don't like this. Stop pretending. Let's stop pretending. Hey, come here. Oh my god, call for help. Don't fight me, Jack. Oh, who? Just Jeez, oh, Pete. No. Oh my god. Janice, call for help. Help, help! Go, Mr. Spock! Go, Mr. Spock! Dude, get in there, man! Geological technician Fisher. Deck 12, section... Fisher. Did I call him Daniels before Fisher? Me. My omen said that? I've been resting here since you left me. Please tell me he didn't kill him. I know it was just one punch, but that seemed pretty dramatic. Andy in sick bay and left with it. I found this bottle in Yeoman Rand's quarters. Okay, so they switched up uniforms, so green is good. Sick bay. They're doing a really a lot of really cool transitions in this one. I gotta check and make sure I know who the director is. Please don't be in here with anybody else. Okay, so his face is scratched. That's a good thing. I didn't know what to do. Oh my God. And then to have your attacker's face person right there in front of you. You started talking about us. Us. Don't be mad at her, Jim. He is the captain. I couldn't be. Oh, I hate this. You started hurting me. I had to fight you, scratch your face. God, that would be so awful to hear that about yourself or, you know, about. Are there any scratches? I don't like this aggressive, like... I was in my room. It wasn't me. Uh, Fisher saw you, too. Fisher saw you. I wouldn't have even mentioned it. Oh, it wasn't no. me. It was you, sir. Oh, good, he's alive, thank God. You know what you're saying? Yes. I know what I'm saying. 
Okay, so you keep Green Shirt uh, Kirk somewhere where he's being watched, and then you just scour the, the ship. Oh, I feel so bad for her. I mean, if ever there was a need for a ship's counselor. We have an imposter aboard. Yeah, there we go. Use that logic spot. I know he's still working through it this early, but that's awesome. On the planet's surface, temperatures are beginning to drop. Oh shit, they can't get them up. How did all this happen? I don't know, sir. But when Fisher came up, his suit was covered with a soft... That magnetic ore. The transporter work at all? Yes, sir. But we don't dare bring up the landing party. It might be duplicated like this animal. How long will it take you to find the trouble? Can't say, sir. Just can't leave those four men down there. It's getting dark, they'll die. Do they not have shuttles? We gotta have an alternative for retrieving a Wii team. I mean, I guess they don't have the shuttles yet. Can't take a chance on killing it. We have no previous experience, no way of knowing what would happen to you. Really? The man has to be harmed. Yeah, it's done. He'd be taken without. Oh, there's something wrong with Jim. The search parties are to capture you. Tell them. It's done. Search parties, Captain. Yes, I'll make an announcement to the entire crew. There's something wrong. You're the captain of this ship. You haven't the right to be vulnerable in the eyes of the crew. Uh, they lose faith, and you lose command. This isn't a Klingon vessel. What I don't know is why I forgot that just now. Okay, so is there a chance that neither of these are Jim? If you see me slipping again. Take command. Your orders. To take command. Come on, just say it. Or to tell me. Understood, Captain. Oh, shit. Okay, so I'm not sure about the lore here, but I know in, like, the next generation, if a, a superior officer or a commanding officer exhibits, like, medical symptoms, they can be removed from command by the chief medical officer. So can Bones do that now? I have lost my strength of will. Decisions are becoming more... Oh. There's an imposter aboard the ship. A man who looks exactly like me and is pretending to be me. You have to do that. The imposter may be identified by scratches on his face. He just warned him. All search parties report to Mr. Spock for assignment. Good. Yeah, send him to Spock. I... L God, Captain Kirk. I don't know. I sort of like what he's doing. Makeup? Oh, I don't like this. Anybody that's been in theater knows that that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how easy it is, especially when you're all sweaty. Wilson, give me your phaser. Yes, sir. Wilson, why did you listen? How you been? Fine, sir. Oh, he's gonna kill him. <laughs> Jesus. It's already 20 degrees below zero. Oh my God, they have their jackets? Thermal heaters were transported down. They duplicated they won't operate oh my god transporter technician wilson found injured near the captain's cabin I'm not dead though thank god called him by name took his hand phaser jeez oh, acknowledge continue the search okay so i have like a lot of questions i'm going to save them for the end but apparently this double however different in temperament has your knowledge of the ship its crew its devices knowledge of everything where would you go to elude a mass search Jeffrey's tubes? The lower levels. The engineering deck. Man, Kirk and Spock together. Even this kind of reduced Kirk. So good. I never really had as much an appreciation for Leonard Nimoy's Spock because I haven't had that much experience with him. He's so fucking good. Man, I would have liked to have watched this when it first came out. I bet you this was amazing. If I'm to be the captain, I've got to act like one. You're compromised, Jim. I'm not sure how. Oh, shit. Man, I would love to see Spock v. Kirk. Oh, come on. I want to see that. I want to see that big time. Yeah, really good cuts. Really good cuts. You can see him coming a little bit, but really good cuts. I mean, I really want that. I really want a, a, a bad Kirk v. Spock fist fight now. Can I call my shot? I'm calling my shot. I want a, a bad Kirk v. Spock fist fight. Get that, get that phaser up a little bit, you know. 
Very relaxed with it. Oh, shit. Good use of the screen there to blur the identity. Come on, Jim. Moment of truth. Stun him. Nice job. You can't kill me. It's a hell of a bet you're taking there. You need me. Man, I have so many questions. I don't need you. Yep. <laughs> that was my first Vulcan nerve pinch. Nice. Spock. Gosh. We'll talk a little bit about Spock afterwards, too. What's the matter with me? I've got a theory. Losing the power of decision. You have a point, Spock? Yes. The evil ones is what makes the decisions. Unusual opportunity to appraise the human mind. Or to examine, in Earth terms, the roles of good and evil. His command comes from his bad side. The captain's gut you're analyzing. Are you aware of that, Spock? Yes. And oh. what is it that makes one man an exceptional leader? We see here indications that it is his negative side which makes him strong. Look at that. Your negative side. Removed from you, the power of command begins to elude you. Fascinating. What is your point, Mr. Spock? You need him. If I seem insensitive to what you're going through, Captain, understand. It's the way I am. <laughs> Spock. Captain Kirk. Having a friend like Spock would be amazing because he would tell you exactly what he thought. <laughs> I found a new trouble with a transporter. The casing has a wide gap ripped in it. Okay. Can you give us a status report, Captain? Temperature's still dropping. Now 41 degrees below zero. Ah, oh, poor Sulu. It shouldn't be much longer. Do you think you might be able to find a long rope somewhere and throw <laughs> us down a pot of hot coffee? Oh, I love it. I'll see what we can do. God, what hell to be a commanding officer in that situation. What hell? You're, you're powerless to help. How bad is it? We can't repair it in less than a week. Okay, so we need another plan. My negative self is under restraint in sick bay. My own indecisiveness growing. Jim, you're gonna have to give command to Spock. Yeah, you have to. Oh my God, Sulu. There you go. They did that before. Um. I think we ought to give room service another call. That coffee's taking too long. I'm really digging Sulu, too. Kirk here, Mr. Sulu. Hotline direct to the captain. Are we that far gone? Oh. We're using hand phases to keep the rock. It's smart. It's smart. Any possibility of getting us back aboard before the skiing season opens down here? Oh, my God. That'd, be, that'd tear me apart. Survival procedures, Mr. Sulu. Per your training program, Mr. Spock. Spock's training program. I can see some of the cheesy acting that people talk about before. I'm still down with it, though. Fuck it. <laughs> Whatever. What happened, Pearl? Great transitions. He's not dying. Yes, he is. Oh, shit. How can I survive without him? I don't know, Jim. These are good cuts. Don't be afraid. He's gonna to touch that hand. The the restraint is the the break in the. Here's my hand. Fantastic. Hold on. There we go. Together maybe. Jim, he is back. He's got to stay with him. This is really a fascinating episode. I have to take him back. Inside myself. Yeah, but the transporter's down. I don't want to take him back. He's like an animal. A thoughtless, brutal animal. No. Got to see that. To see that that's how you make your decisions. <sighs> not different than anyone else. Well. A lot of what he is makes you the man you are. Yep. Your strength of command lies mostly in him. What a revelation. What a self-revelation. The intelligence, the logic, it appears you have has most of that. And perhaps that's where man's essential courage comes from. 
No. Jim Kirk doesn't use that, though. I mean, you definitely need each other. Would you come to the transporter room? We think we may have found an answer. Oh, thank God. There shouldn't be more than a five-point variation in the velocity balance. Whatever that means, I trust you, Spock. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, Spock, you're gonna have to take it over here pretty soon. I'll grab him by the scruff of the neck and hold him as long as I can. Well, Jesus, Scotty! It's painless and quick. The animal will be unconscious for only a few minutes. It's smart, you have to do it. Now, I wonder if the, the dog thing is experiencing the same type of, like, medical degradation that evil Kirk is experiencing. It'll work, I don't know what will. I'm pretty sure one of those dogs is fake, too. <laughs> Are they just gonna do a pad to pad? Energize. I don't think we've ever seen a pad to pad in the original series. Reverse. Reverse. Man, this seems super duper untested. We're gonna have like a Brundle fly moment here where it's like, ah, ah. It's back, but it's the knocked out one. He's dead, Jim. We did get a he's dead, Jim, though, so I'm gonna put that down. My bingo card. Entry made by second officer Spock. Second officer? Who's first officer, then? Animal could have died of some kind of shock. But once I agree with you, Doctor, I said could have, Mr. Spock. Oh, shit, you set him up for that, didn't you, Leonard? The shock. Induced by blind terror. It didn't know what was happening. It couldn't understand. You can. You have your intelligence controlling your fear. Get the transporter room ready. Could be, if, maybe, all guesswork so far. Just theory. Yeah, it really is. Do an autopsy and let Spock check out the transporter circuits again. They have to get them fixed to get the landing party up. Jim, you can't risk your life on a theory. God, that makes so much sense, though. I have a human half, you see, as well as an alien half, submerged, constantly at war with each other. Hmm. I survive it because my intelligence wins out over both, makes them live together. Oh, man. Somebody make the decision. Oh, no. Are you relinquishing your command, Captain? Yes, you have to. No. No, I'm not. And make the decision, Jim. Decision is yours. <sighs> Mr. Spock, ready the transporter room. I'm going back and forth with how I like the way Shatner's playing this, and I understand what he's doing. And again, we've talked about it before. This is a lot of stage conventions that he's using, you know, like gestures to convey emotion. Kirk here. Oh, no. Captain. Please tell me that. Suda. Here. Please tell me they're not dead. Hundred. Seventeen below. Oh no. Can't last much longer. God, the pressure. Two men. Unconscious. Okay, they're not dead though. Can't wait. No time. Oh my god. It's delivered very well. Mr. Sulu. Jim, pull the trigger. You have to. If it works, it doesn't. You gotta get him up there. Can't wait. You can't. Better than die. What are you gonna do? Oh, wow. That's what I have to do. What we have to do. So is the evil one brave or fearful? I think it's fearful, right? I feel so weak. Nah, this is all a trick. <laughs> Kirk v. Kirk? <laughs> well, evil Kirk's gonna, yeah, he's gonna kick his ass. You don't mind if I come to your cabin later? No, sir. I hate this. Ugh. No way to Mr. Carl, sir. Prepare to leave orbit, Mr. Carl. What? But what about? They can't be saved. Prepare to leave orbit. Come on, no. Mr. Spock, you know who I am. You know what that is. Mr. Spock, which one? What do we do? Logic. He wants you to think that he's Captain Kirk. Come on, Jim. Yes, I know. Oh my God, they're... It's my ship! My ship is mine! No, 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 no. I'll kill you. Yeah, he will. You know that you'll die. So will you. We'll both die. Come on, Jim. Please. Yeah, he's, he's fear. I want to live! This is a crazy episode. I am really digging it. Let's just walk. If this doesn't work.
or a few years before that you have been and always will be my friend. Oh, good use of the music. Ready. I'm, I'm sorry, I went Spock on this transporter, on this, this little endeavor. God, Spock is so amazing. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Is there a better Starfleet officer at this time than Spock? There can't be. There cannot be. Well, Mr. Spock. He's got to let it, let it cook. Let him cook there, Leonard. Does he have the scratches? Doesn't matter, but I'm just curious if they carried through. Get those men aboard fast. Oh, that's it. He's back. Did everybody make it? Ah, oh, poor Sulu. I've seen a part of myself no man should ever see. Yeah. Which part, though? Thank you, Mr. Spock, from both of us. Shall I pass that on to the crew, sir? The imposter's back where he belongs. Let's forget him. How can you? Oh, great episode. Boy, oh, boy. Well, sir, what I'd like to say is that... Thank you, Yolan. Janice, you don't have to say anything. The imposter had some interesting qualities, wouldn't you say? Uh, no. If you mean being an assaulting asshole. <laughs> Almsman, steady as she goes. Oh my gosh, I love these episodes so much. Directed by Leo Penn. Leo Penn. Richard Matheson, writer. Oh, fantastic shit, I love these. Great, great, great stuff. Oh my goodness. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right, my friends, we just finished watching Star Trek Season 1, Episode 5, The Enemy Within, and the only thing left to do is talk about it. All right, my friends, just got done watching Star Trek, the original series, Season 1, Episode 5, The Enemy Within. I thought this one was another banger. Um, again, I think if I'm ranking them out of the ones that I've enjoyed uh, with Where No Man Has Gone Before and The Naked Time and now The Enemy Within, I think I would probably put them in that order with Where No Man Had Gone Before first, uh, Naked Time 2, Enemy Within 3. Enemy Within was very, very good, and I think I liked it more for what it didn't say as to what it did. Um, a couple things I wanted to talk about, and again, I want to try to make these more succinct instead of me rambling. So the first thing that I liked a whole bunch was the idea that Kirk's, when Kirk was split, you know, neither side was Kirk, you know, obviously it wasn't the whole, but the idea that his decision making, which at the, at the very core of his command, the ability to make these decisions was actually housed in his evil side. That's fantastic because I mean, sure. I, I, I'm sure psychologically there are ways to approach this and say, oh, well, you know, yes, the more aggressive side of your brain, you know, carries decisions and life and death type of stuff, you know, fight or flight. Um, and I don't know nearly enough about psychology to be able to speak intelligently on that. I'm speaking about it uh, from a purely story driven part. The story-driven part of all of this in the split of Captain Kirk does two major things for me. One, it shows Jim the that, you know, you've got these two parts to yourself. And, you know, when push comes to shove, neither is any good without the other. But the real problem is, is the one that makes makes you Captain Kirk is the evil side, which I find to be fascinating because that is a revelation that you've got to live with that you've got to know that you know it's no it's not your like i think about it like this if picard and i don't know if this ever happened if picard got split between two people i think that his captain or or orders or or leadership capabilities would come from the logic driven side like the 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 intelligence driven side Whereas Kirk's like gut instincts, his, his, you know, you know, really, you know, fire, that type of uh, Kirk aggression when he's in the chair that we actually see in like Wrath of Khan that I've seen in Wrath of Khan and some of the movies and things like that. Um, when you see Kirk like really fired up, he, the, the, the base or the foundation of those decisions comes from the evil side. That is great. And that's something that Jim saw, recognized and relates to at the end when you know, asked about the two sides. He goes, ah, you know, I saw something that a man should never see before. A part of me that a man never should see before. My question is this, which part is he referencing? Is he saying, oh, me, the, the, the nice guy saw the evil guy, the decision maker, and I never should see that. Or is this, now that they're rejoined, is this the 
decision making Kirk, the evil Kirk going, I saw a side of myself I didn't like. I like to think that there's a possibility it could be either. You know, I saw this weakling that couldn't make decisions. Is this just as viable a theory as I saw this evil guy who did evil things, you know, but made the decisions. So I'm wondering where that that statement came from. I really like that. I really like the idea that, you know, he it, it's not a struggle. He knows what he is now. But at the same time, it's a it was a rev it had to have been a revelation as to exactly how he was able to, you know, do these things and make these decisions that it came from that place. Great. So Jim goes forward knowing that about himself. And again, that's part of the episodic. So you're not really sure how much he's going to carry on to future episodes. But again, if we're just looking at the character of Kirk, this is a revelation. The other thing that I liked a whole lot about this kind of splitting Kirk into two, I think that, and again, episodic and not serialized. So I don't think we're going to see any kind of development of this, but at least it's a point that they could use like for the movies later, whenever they are drawing from things from the series. Um, I think that uh, I, it, this split did a lot to increase or strengthen the friendship between Kirk and Spock. You know, Spock had that admission. Um, I think it's the first time he actually admitted the fact that he is half human and, you know, his Vulcan side are constantly at war. I don't remember him saying that in any of the other episodes. And so you're dealing with, you know, what I like, too, is we we're seeing Leonard Nimoy get more and more into the boots of Spock here, you know, with the Vulcan nerve pinch, which I read in another, uh, when I was doing a and a for another episode, he came up with, like, on the spot. Like, he was just like, ah, well, you know what? Here's a way to incapacitate somebody. Let me try this nerve pinch. Um, I also heard that, that Bill Shatner demonstrated it. So uh, the director, I'm assuming of this episode, uh, Leo Penn, would be like, oh, OK, that's how it works. Cool. So I, I read that in a prior one when it was talking about uh, Leonard Nimoy developing Spock. So that's awesome to finally be able to see that for the first time. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that. I thought we got I, I think that the away team element added a level of tension that wouldn't have been there. Uh, I think that there would have been a, it would have been tense and there would have been consequences that would have been at play and the stakes being the life of the captain. But I really appreciated the idea that there was an away team that really was independent of what was going on with Captain Kirk or on the ship that was in desperate need of the ship to figure its shit out and come down and get them. That really added a level of tension, a level of like, there was no, without that, I think that you would have had a more delayed response to I, I don't think I know you would have had a more delayed response to going, uh, you know, trying to combine the two halves. I think, you know, especially after the death of that unicorn dog, that it would have been like, we got to spend time. We've got to take our time with this. It, it killed the dog, you know, and but they didn't have that to spend because of the away team ad like that B plot that they threw in, um, which is a great idea. It was a really, really solid idea to make the whole episode, I think, you know, razor's edge, you know, Cracker Jack timing and making sure that all of these things hit at the right time. Really, really good stuff. Um, I, you know, Bones was Bones. Bones and, you know, uh, Spock going head to head against the different decision makings and things like that. I think Bones is a little bit of a dick sometimes that he'll say something and, you know, then uh, Spock's like, uh, well, you know, that I actually agree with you, Doctor. And he's like, I said should have. Oh, OK, calm down, Leonard. Jesus. <laughs> It's like he just always wants to fight Spock. He can't just let let bet you know well enough alone and be like, hey, we agree this time. He's just always ready to butt heads with him, which is hilarious. But whatever. Um, let's see anybody else that we saw. You know, Scotty. I think it was kind of weird, not weird, but I think it was kind of telling that this was a situation that took Scotty longer than typically normal. You know, Scotty was like, I don't know how long this is going to take. This is uh, this is really really bad. Normally, Scotty's pretty well. From the Scotty that I've seen so far, Scotty is pretty optimistic on getting repairs done or, you know, coming up with a workaround or um, he at least has an idea or you know, a path or a course or, a, you know, a plotting of actions. And he didn't seem to have a whole lot of that in this one. So, again, I think that it w was a writing device to add to the stakes as well, that even, you know, Scotty was having problems figuring this out. So that added to the tension and the, the time constraints and blah, blah, blah. But I think what I want to end with this is, you know, Spock, it's amazing to me that, you know, again, just as a brief recap, my experience with the original series before I began all of this was simply The Wrath of Khan and the original series movies forward. So I've seen Wrath of Khan numerous times. It's one of my favorite all-time movies. 
Um, but I've only seen like the search for Spock and Voyage Home and was it Undiscovered, not Undiscovered Country, Final Frontiers 5 and then Undiscovered Country. I think that's how they go. I've only ever seen all of those like one time. And I think I've seen Undiscovered Country like twice, maybe. If that's the one where it's like the Kittimer Accords, I've seen that one twice. Um, so that that's my Spock basis. That and like, you know, like the Kelvin timeline and um, a couple times when he popped up in uh, Next Generation and, and things like that, you know, like older, you know, um, out of Starfleet Spock, because most of the time in the movies, he's he's not even a member of the crew, I don't, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so I think it's really fascinating to see Spock as an actual working member of the crew, which probably seems really weird to everybody else. Like, dude, he's like the crew. And um, I completely agree. I, I, I'm amazed by how fascinating his character is, how incredibly competent Spock is. And I've said it once and I'll say it again. In this time era, the TOS time era, uh, era is there another member of Starfleet as important as Spock? I don't think so. I mean, you, you can add, you know, Captain Kirk, sure, he's the captain of the Enterprise. But Spock is this incredibly vital component to every mission success so far on the Enterprise. Not to mention he's, you know, I'm assuming that's still canon, like the first Vulcan in Starfleet. I think with Spock's inclusion as half Vulcan, half human, that you have that eventual like intergalactic feel to Starfleet, you know. Um, Spock is a rarity right now as the, uh, to my knowledge, the only alien on the Enterprise, alien on the Enterprise. Um, but we know that going forward, we have a lot more species represented on, in Starfleet. And you have to think that's uh, in no small part to Spock's doing, you know, Spock's inclusion and Spock's incredible service record by its very nature would probably open the doors for a lot of the other kind of founding uh, 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 species of the Federation. You know, I, I just, it, he's just so important. And not to mention, he's fucking cool as shit. Being able to like come up with all of these things and, you know, keeping it all, like I said in the episode during the reaction, what better friend than Spock? Because, I mean, with Spock, you know that whatever he tells you is the truth. And in, and, you know, normally that's a good and bad thing to have someone be very honest with you. But with Spock, Spock is also so highly intelligent and so highly observant that normally when he tells you the his truth, it's legit. You know, it's not like he's telling you something that's flavored with his like emotions or his with his greed or with his narcissism or pride or blah, blah, blah. He's telling you the facts as they stand. And what better I mean, what better friend to tell you what's what than Spock? And I can't imagine that that didn't play a huge role in uh, James T. Kirk and Spock's eventual, like, friendship. Like, their their incredible friendship that, you know, kind of comes to a head in uh, Wrath of Khan. That, you know, Kirk always needed somebody that was a straight shooter. And Spock is the straightest shooter ever. Just love it. So anyway, another amazing episode. I loved it very, very much. These episodes are so good, my friends. I mean, they are so damn good. Um, I can't believe, I'm so glad I'm doing this now, but I can't believe it's taken me this late in life to be able to watch and appreciate all of these. But I'm so glad you're here with me watching them. I I love it. I just, I'm, I'm really over the moon that uh, this decision was made. Uh, correctly by me. I guess my evil half made this decision to start watching the original series. And uh, I, I thank you, evil half. I appreciate it. Um, so my friends, if you could hit that like button, smash the subscribe, ringy ding ding that bell for notifications for any time we go live here on YouTube with any Star Trek or sci-fi related content. And of course, if you'd like any of that early or in a longer format, Link to Patreons in the description. We'd love to have you over there. But right now, my friends, I would like you to Vulcan roll. But if you could, take one second while we go to Q&A. Well, hello, mon capitans, and welcome to another installment of Q&A. My friends, this is where I go through after each watching each episode of the original series, and any questions that I have, I actually go and look them up and get them answered, while at the same time, 
maybe uncovering a couple bits of trivia that make the the actual experience of watching the episode a little bit more interesting, at least to me. Um, right now, I'm over on Memory Alpha, a great, great website. Link in the description. If you're ever in need of a cast reaction or some type of trivia, I highly recommend going over there and just diving in. You'll get you'll waste some time and get lost, and it's not really a waste, but uh, you'll have a lot of fun, especially if you're a fan of Star Trek. Real, I mean, I... Couldn't, I can't speak any more highly of it. It's absolutely fa fascinating. So, my friends, uh, a couple things that I found here. Um, Richard Matheson, who was the writer, uh, his inspiration came, not surprisingly, from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Robert Louis Stevenson's story about a person that has two very defined halves and becomes physically both of those halves. Um, I think it was very fascinating because he wanted to take the idea of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, place it in space, and place it on a person that was in a position of command. How would people react knowing both, you know, both pieces and then having known the whole before? Great, fascinating stuff. Really, really good stuff. Now, what I here's one that I thought was surprising. In uh, uh, Richard Matheson's original script, Sulu and the away team being in danger was not a part of it. This was later added not by Matheson, but by the writer room, writing room or the writers, the creatives that were on set during the actual shooting of uh, The Enemy Within. And they thought that by putting these people in danger, it added more tension, which I said in both the reaction and my thoughts, I absolutely did. Matheson disagreed. He believed that, be vehemently disagreed. Um, Matheson believed that B plots or subplots slowed down the re the main story. I wonder if he changed his mind after having seen this, because it's very obvious that it, it didn't. It did the opposite. It it sped things up. It accelerated things to make sure that, uh, you know, they were able to have a resolution a lot quicker than actually you know having to science this thing. It was it was more of a seat of your pants type of stuff, and um, you know I I, it, I mentioned it in the reaction. I think it was a very strong device. Okay, and uh, one of the other things that was script-related was an omission. And this was supposed to be kind of the, the tagline that sends us off into space. You know, normally Kirk or Spock deliver it, uh, from my experience, and then we kind of like exit the Enterprise and go out into space, or the music pulls up after this line. It's, the, it's our closing line for the episode. And apparently the original, original closing line for this one came from Bones. And I really, really like it, and I really kind of wish they would have left it in there. But the line was this. Uh, McCoy is musing at the end, and he says that part of the human condition was having an enemy within. And I think that that, even though it was, oh, he said the thing, the name of the episode, I think that that was a very powerful, you know, kind of send-off that they they lost. I think that would have been a very you know, very prophetic type of, you know, enemy within and then let it go. But anyway, they didn't use it, but I think it's cool that it was in there. Um, the other thing that I, I thought was really interesting, very interesting, came with the different props that they use on the sets, which I, you know, I'm always fascinated by the the sets and how they dress them and the uniforms and all of that. But when we mentioned that whenever uh, the, the technician beamed up and had the magnetic ore on them, they used the device that looked kind of like a hand vac. <laughs> Here's the cool shit about that. The scanning device that Scott uses to uh, check Fisher's uniform um, was actually a modified, this is crazy, a modified nuclear Chicago model 2586 Cutie Pie radiation detector. It wasn't like a made up something or other that came from like a hand blender or something like that. This was an actual radiation detector. I mean... Crazy stuff. I absolutely love it. Um, now, uh, to end with the uh, some of the special effects that they use, I'm always fascinated by the, the effects and everything that kind of went into this. I mean, the, the whole nine yards, crazy. It's just an attention to detail that's, that's really fascinating for the time especially. And there's an omission to detail here in a little bit. That's what I'll end on. But right now, um, we got to see the first spread phaser effect by hand phaser when Sulu heated up the rocks. Great stuff, great stuff. And a device they use, again, that I remember them using um, in movies or Next Generation at some point to, to mimic that effect, shoot, heat up the rocks and use them for warmth. I remember them doing that at some point. I can't remember when, though. Um, and then, again, the split screens where they had both negative and positive Kirk uh, on screen at the same time. Most of it was clever camera angles and, you know, one of them looking away while the, the face presented Kirk was William Shatner. But in a couple of the scenes where they actually had split screens, 
I, I mentioned that in sick bay, you could kind of tell that where the band of the restraint was for uh, negative Kirk laying in the bed was a great place to have a shot cut. And he was able to grab the hand of them using that kind of cut with the black band of the arm really imaginative stuff. Um, you know, the transitions in this one were really, really well done. And this was the director who was, uh, was Leo Penn was the director. So these were decisions that I'm assuming that Leo made that were very, very well done. A couple of experiments in there we haven't seen yet, which I really, really appreciated. Now, with all that being said, and, uh, you know, this incredible attention to detail, there was one goof up. And we picked it up on it when we were walking, watching through. The delta on the uniform was absent at one point. And I speculated, ah, this will be a good way to tell them apart. No delta to delta. But then when they went back to the scene, the delta was back. Apparently, and I think this is great, union rules dictated that each day the uniforms had to be washed. You couldn't put an actor into an unwashed uniform. It was just, you know, part of union union regulations and union bylaws was to have everything washed and ready for them. So whenever they washed the uniforms, they would peel off the deltas to keep them from being ruined. Wash the uniforms and put them back on. Someone forgot to put them back on. So my friends, that's another little bit of lore for our travels through the original series of Star Trek. My friends, thank you so much for being here. And again, this is the conclusion of this episode of Q&A. So, mon capitans, if you could, Vulcan roll, and I'll see you next time.